Turing 6502, The Index Registers. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. This is the block diagram for our Turing 6502 that we've built previously in this playlist. And there really are just two main components, the rule book and the notepad. But we also need a way to keep track of the current rule and where we are on the notepad. Now you can see that I broke the notepad into two parts, the 6502 notepad and the Apple II system memory. The 6502 notepad address is determined directly from the rule book, but addressing into the system memory is controlled by the memory address registers. Now, memory address registers are one of the main features of von Neumann architectures. However, by moving the MAR into hardware and moving to an 8-bit symbol, we increase the speed of the machine by orders of magnitude. And this is because random access is faster than sequential access. In fact, we were able to get it to run in real time. For some of you, when you first saw this architecture, you may have been a little sceptical that this could actually run Apple II software. But hopefully, as I describe more and more instructions, it becomes a little clearer. Not everyone gets excited by building an emulator, but the real significance here is that the machine running the emulator is far simpler than the CPU being emulated. I'm planning to go over the addressing modes of the 6502 in the next video, but before I do that I need to go over the index registers, as well as some of the operations associated with them. So let's jump right in. The 6502 has two 8-bit index registers labelled X and Y. This part of the 6502 architecture is quite a departure from its older sibling, the 6800 CPU, which has a single 16-bit index register. The variety in the addressing modes is one of the reasons that 6502 is so powerful. The main purpose of the index registers is effective address calculation. This is where we compute the main memory address of the data that we're interested in. The effective address calculation is part of the decode cycle, although some other CPUs, such as the 68000, have an individual instruction for it. We also often use the index registers as counters. There are a limited number of operations that can change the index registers. These are load and store, compare, increment and decrement, and finally, transfers. From a status register perspective, operations involving the index registers tend to only affect the negative and zero flag. Now from our 6502 instruction set, I'm going to look at LDY and LDX immediate first. For good measure, I'm going to throw in the LDA immediate instruction, which is a little off topic right now, but it essentially uses the same rulebook template as LDX and LDY. And it's a good example of how I was able to make new instructions from templates of other instructions. There are actually multiple versions of these instructions which use different addressing modes. So for now, I'm just going to look at the immediate mode. In immediate mode, the operand, or value that we're interested in, is held in the next byte immediately after the instruction. A bit like the offset for branch instructions. Therefore, instructions with immediate mode addressing use two bytes one for the opcode and one for the operand. We use the hash symbol to signify immediate mode addressing. Apart from load, many arithmetic and logical instructions also use immediate mode addressing. However, I handle LDA, LDX, and LDY differently in the Turing 6502, and this is mainly done for performance reasons. Don't worry, I'll go over these instructions in immediate mode in later videos. Here's the same strip of code we saw in the jump video. Remember the 4C at location 7BE0? But here we see the LDY immediate mode instruction at 7BDE. And we can also see some other instructions before it. Now, what we want to have happen is that the 7B at location 7BDF gets moved into the Y register. And for this particular instruction, we want to set the N and the Z flags appropriately. For the N flag, we just copy the most significant bit, which is bit 7 of the data value, into bit 7 of the status register. The hexadecimal value of 7b doesn't have bit 7 set, so we clear the n flag in this case. But 7b hexadecimal is also not 0, so we clear the 0 flag as well. Like all the instructions we've seen so far, we add them into our switch statement. And when making the rule book, we add them as arcs out of rule 28. The a0 arc is for LDY, a2 is for LDX, and a9 is for LDA. Now let's see how we might implement LDY in our C equivalent code. First, we increment the program counter to point at the data that we're interested in. 
Then we load this value from system memory into Y. Then we test Y to see if it's zero. If so, we jump to the clear N, clear Z fast rulebook, which I'll go over soon. Otherwise, we test bit eight and we either set or clear the negative flag. Just to start to get you used to the nomenclature used in computer science, I'm gonna start referring to these rulebook diagrams as state diagrams, also sometimes state machines. I'll use these terms interchangeably. Now first we see the program counter increment, which should be starting to look pretty familiar. Then we prepare for the system memory read at state 2018. Then in this state, we just write into the index register the value we found in main memory. But now the next rule that we go to is determined by what we wanna to do to the status register. When the value of the data we're interested in is between one and seven F hexadecimal, we wanna to go to the clear N, clear Z fast rulebook. We load the status register and end it with 7D hexadecimal, which has the effects of clearing bits one and seven. Here's the diagrammatic form of clear N, clear Z fast. We do this at the end of the execute cycle, and we can jump to fast fetch directly because we know the value in the MAR high register is PCH. We have a similar set of rules, clear N, set Z fast, for when the value of interest is equal to zero. And in this case, we clear bit seven and set bit one. And then finally, we have the set N clear Z fast rules, which are for values between eight zero and FF hexadecimal. In this case, we set bit seven and clear bit one. Now what we don't have is set n and set z. That's because in two's complement, a number can't be negative and zero at the same time. So these rules don't exist. Let's step through these states with our ship. 28, 2016, 2018, 41, back to 26. And now compare what the real machine does. 28, 2016, 2018, 41, and 26. Exactly the same pattern. I use this state machine diagram for LDY as a template for LDX and LDA. Watch again. Only the 6502 notepad pointer location changes between the different machines. I want to go over how we use the index registers as counters. The INX and INY instructions add one to X and Y respectively, and the value FF hexadecimal rolls over to zero without setting carry. DEC X and DEC Y subtract one from X and Y respectively, and zero rolls over to FF again without setting carry. The zero flag is set if the result is zero, otherwise it's cleared. And the negative flag is set if bit 7 of the result is set, otherwise it's cleared. Going back to our C model, we add these instructions to our switch statement. 88 is decrement Y, C8 is increment Y, CA is decrement X, and E8 is increment X. But things get a bit more interesting when we go to implement them in our state machine. It turns out we really only need one set of rules for increment and decrement, and we do this by altering the 6502 notepad pointer. So for the 88 arc, we set the 6502 notepad pointer to the IY variable. But for CA, we set the 6502 notepad pointer to the IX variable. This just simplifies the amount of unique code that we have to write. So coming into rule 307, we can either be pointing at index X or index Y. Then we read the value, write back the value plus one, and jump to the appropriate flag setting state machine. The deck index state machine is very similar. We come into rule 306 with the 6502 notepad pointer pointing at the ix variable or the iy variable. Then we read the value and write back the value minus one. And finally, we jump to the appropriate flag setting state machine. So for an inx instruction, we might go through states 28, 307, 41, and back to 26. Here's a fragment of code from Pac-Man for the INX instruction. You'll see we jump through the same states. The last set of instructions I wanna go over in this video are the transfers. Index X can transfer to and from the accumulator and stack pointer. 
while index Y can only transfer to and from the accumulator. Transfer X to stack pointed doesn't change the negative or zero flags, but for all other instructions, the zero flag is set if the result is zero and clear otherwise, and the negative flag is set if bit seven of the result is set, otherwise it's cleared. Again, we just add all of these instructions as arcs out of rule 28. But remember from the jump video, it was problematic transferring values between variables. But if we go back to Turing's paper, he said the scan symbol is the only one of which the machine is, so to speak, directly aware. However, by altering its M configuration, the machine can effectively remember some of the symbols it's seen previously. So for these transfers, we can use the same idea we used for jump. We transfer the value in the A register variable into the state or rule number. Then we read the value in the index X register, ignore it, and instead write back the value that was in the A register, which we know because of the state. And finally, we jump to the appropriate rules for setting flags. But by doing this, we use 257 different rules for each transfer. So for six different transfers, that's over 1,500 rules. Now if we look at the current design, we see that we've only allowed 13 bits for the rule number. So the maximum number of rules we can have is 8,192. So I don't really want to waste 1,500 rules just for these. So what I'm going to do is transfer four bits at a time. Then when we're done, we can set the flags appropriately. So now what I do in the state machine, is transfer the lower four bits first. And so now what I do is read the A register variable and branch to one of 16 states based on the lower four bits. Then in these states, 205 to 220, I write back the lower four bits into the index X register. Then I read the A variable again and branch to one of 16 states based on the upper four bits. Then in states 222 to 237, I write back the upper four bits into the X register variable, and then I jump to one of the appropriate flag setting state machines. Now, assume the A register variable had the value zero. Try to figure out which states we'd walk through. Now, in this case, we walk through 205 and 222 because we had zero in both nibbles. Now we have a fragment of Pac-Man code about to execute the TAX instruction. You can see the A register variable holds zero. And now you can see it step through states 205 and 222. And this is the behavior we would expect with zero in A. We can think of the TAX instruction as being a prototype, and we can replicate it for TXA, TAY, TYA, and also TSX. We just cut and paste the template and update some of the 6502 notepad pointers as appropriate. The exception is TXS. This instruction does not update the flags. So at the end, we just jump to fast fetch. Each of these instructions now only use 34 rules. So now hopefully you can see how I was able to use 200 rules instead of 1500 rules. Well, that's the end of this video. Next video I'll start talking about address modes. And don't forget to like, subscribe and share.